Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Deborah Cobray. How many of you were expecting Pastor Mike and Sue? Oh. First time, my name is Deb, and I'm married to the big guy over there sitting with the orange shirt. Mine just want to stand up and wave and say hi to everybody. <laughs> we we do want to play. How many of you in here have kids? How many of you in here don't have children, but you're here tonight? Okay, well there's a few of you. Well, anything you're going to hear tonight, you can apply to life. So you don't have to have children to hear this message. But I'm. My name is Deborah, and I married Jim, gosh, 35 years ago. We brought a blended family together. He had a daughter, and I had a daughter. And our testimony, which is not new news in this church, because we, we've been sharing our lives with you for 35 years, but I was an ex-druggy, drug dealer, whatever you want to call it, raised in a Christian home. My mom was a Christian, and Jim wasn't a druggie. He just was a baseball player and an alcoholic, and he loved women and married everybody. I lived with everybody. He married everybody. So when we got saved, not together, but when we got saved, we got changed. We met at a Calvary Chapel in Santa Barbara in 1978. We got married in 1979. I lived in a house ministry there in Santa Barbara. Jim was a businessman and he was rich and I thought my ship had come in and the day that we got married, the ship went right out to sea. <laughs> And we moved from Santa Barbara, and he had a construction company with his dad up in Lake Arrowhead. And so that's how we got to the Inland Empire from Santa Barbara. We never in a million years dreamed that we would ever pastor. We thought we were going to make money for the kingdom of God and finance the gospel. And we had no idea that God had a different idea. And so when we brought this blended family together, we did not know then, looking back 35 years, what a journey it would be and what it would be like to be in ministry as pastors with a blended family, with our history, and to see what God would do. And so tonight, I'm going to finish our testimony and just how, how God has led our family and what God has done in our family. Because, and I've said this all over the world, God has opened up pulpits all over the world for this little message and for this, this preaching. I've preached it at big churches, small churches, and in nations. I've traveled the world because it's a story not of a perfect family, but of a perfect God. And so no matter where your family's at, whether it's intact and it's healthy and you are doing good, or whether your family is just completely messed up, you don't know how it's all going to straighten itself out, I'm here to tell you tonight that with God, Nothing is impossible, and he has a good plan. And if we'll follow the plan, the plan will work. And God's love can fix anything. It can restore anybody. And it can mend the most broken places in the very heart of hearts. And with God, what is impossible with man is possible with God. So will you stand with me, and let's go on this little journey tonight, and I'll finish up. Father, thank you for the ministry of the word tonight. Thank you that you allow us the opportunity to open this book. And Lord, we ask that it would now begin to open up our hearts, that truth would shine in the dark places, that hope would come in, Father, where maybe there isn't any. Lord, that instruction would rise up where we need answers to the questions that we have. Thank you that you are a good Father, that the family is your idea, and we know that it's your will that our families be strong, they be intact, and that they fulfill the destiny that you have placed on their lives. So we ask you tonight in Jesus' name to teach us by the power of your spirit. Amen and amen. Well, go ahead and have a seat. In 35 years, now that we are the old folks here and in our 60s, and Jim being much, much older than I am. <laughs> Just kidding. I started out, and I want to read this verse to you because I think it's worth reading, and it's Psalm 127. So if you've got your Bibles, let's go to the Word because it's the Word that has the power to change us. And if we receive it with meekness, 
It has the power to save our souls and switch our thinking and change our perspective. And that's exactly what has to happen here, is that we've got to go from the natural man, the everyday man that you and I are born into this world in sin, and we get born again, and we get taken out of the kingdom of darkness, and we got placed into this amazing kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is absolutely incredible. But if we don't understand it, if we don't know how it works, then we're not going to be able to function in it very well. And so that's what a change of perspective and a transformation of our minds means, is that we've got to renew our minds to how God sees things and how God works. And when God made this planet, and when he made humanity, he made humanity in his image. The first time you see God, he's actually playing in the dirt and he's making Adam and he's forming man out of the dust of the earth and he's breathing into man the breath of life and man and woman are made in the image of God and he blesses man and he blesses woman and he says be fruitful, multiply, have dominion, subdue and have authority and rule over everything on this planet. He made Adam and Eve the under rulers of planet earth. We know what happened. He said, there's one thing and one tree you can't eat of. You can have all the trees of the garden of Eden, but if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. In other words, the word death in Christianity, the word death in the Bible doesn't mean a, ce a cessation of, of existence. It means a separation. When you die, you don't stop existing. You separate. When we die from these earthly bodies, we separate from these earthly bodies because soul and spirit are eternal. Are you with me? So when Adam and Eve died, when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and they decided to do what God said not to do, that caused death to enter into their being and their nature switched from the God nature now they were under the Lord Satan and now sin entered this world and Satan became the God of this world and we as the descendants of Adam inherited a sin nature are you with me which means that when Adam and Eve had children God said in pain in hard work you're gonna bring forth kids and the earth, which is now cursed because of you, is going to bring up thorns and thistles and weeds. And life where it was made by me to be good and easy and wonderful and productive now is going to be difficult because you're under a different ruler. And so we are born into a sin nature, separated, died from God. And that's why we have to be born again. And this is Christianese, but listen, we're Christians and this is the kingdom of God. And if we don't learn what the Bible says about the kingdom of God, then we're fools because God says, fear not little flock. It's the father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Do you want it? It's yours, but we better learn about it. So start putting our thinking caps on and stay with me because a family could be messed up, more messed up than anybody could ever dream, but God's word and God's kingdom and God's laws can change that family. But we have to understand what is our part in this whole arena of parenting. And listen, parenting is not for cowards. It is not. Christianity isn't either. This is about hanging in there and it's about believing God and it's about raising your kids in faith. And so God has a plan for our children and he has a plan for us and it's a good plan. And in Psalm 127, I believe he lays it out and he says, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It's vain for you to rise up early and to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows for so he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Look at your neighbor and say, my children are my reward. Now, some of you may not feel that way right now. And you may be thinking they are, you know, little terrors from hell. And where did they come from? And who stole your children from you? But children are a reward. They are an inheritance from God. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them, but shall speak with their enemy. They shall not be ashamed. Parents will not be ashamed, but they'll speak with their enemies at the gate. Now, that's a very unusual scripture. God is saying that your reward and your inheritance and your legacy that you're going to leave is your kids. Because God's a God of descendants and dominion. God doesn't take back what he said. He's not a man that he should lie, and he doesn't change his mind. When God blessed Adam and Eve, and he said, be fruitful, multiply, subdue, have dominion. Rule this earth as I rule the heavens. You are my under rulers. And when Adam and Eve messed up, then God already had the plan formulated 
to bring mankind back to himself. It would take centuries and millenniums, and it would take the Messiah, Jesus himself, by becoming the last Adam, the heavenly man, that would come and that would pay the price at Calvary and would redeem us, reconcile us, and then restore us back. And that is exactly what God now says we can do with our families. He is redemptive, he buys us back, he reconciles us, he brings us back, and he restores us. He gives us back all that was lost. And if you know anything about biblical restoration, God always gives back more than was ever lost. Always. So if the devil's playing hell in your family right now, I got some good news for you. Because whatever he has stolen from you, he has to give back sevenfold, and he has to release it in the name of Jesus. And family curses can be broken, and family patterns can be stopped, and God can start brand new and fresh with your family if you're willing to believe God and do what he says to do. Because that's what God did for our family. Because we come from some pretty squirrely people, both of us. Last week, I had to run up to Washington and be with my folks again because my dad is, is extremely ill. He's 88 today. They've been married 68 years. It's a long time. And I love my family, but I looked at my family and I stepped back and as an outsider coming in, I just said, oh my gosh, God, these are my people. I love them, but they are very, very squirrely. <laughs> Thank God I have a new family. Thank God I have a new way of thinking. Thank God I have the word of God that can set me straight and can change my life. And I've been grafted into the vine and my family is the family of God. I love my natural family, but my family is the family of God. And I am heaven bound and I am in this world, but I am not of it. And either are you if you are born of the spirit of God. So I began to tell you the adventure of our family. And I began to share with you that there were some things that I had to know as a young wife and a, and a young mother. I had a nine-year-old child, a little girl named Miranda, and Jim had Kimberly, and she was just five. And then we had Jessica, and we had Luke, and they came right away. We just were believing God not to have children, but used no birth control, and wasn't that foolish? <laughs> you sow sperms, you're going to get babies. It's called the law of sowing and reaping. So I had to learn some things, and so did Jim. And before we were ever pastors, because we, for the first two years of our marriage, we weren't. We were in the construction business, and we were believing God and learning how to walk in faith. And there were some things that we began to learn as a young couple. And we, be we began to learn that, number one, God is in control. God is sovereign. He's king. He made the universe. He owns the universe. He runs the universe. So if you want to kick up against God, go right ahead. But good luck. It's not going to change a thing. Because God is in control. He is the king. He has created all things and he is sovereign. He is in control. God's word is true. There is truth. And then there is a lie. And Jesus defines what that is in John the 8th chapter. He said that Satan is the father of lies and that there is no truth in him. God is truth. What God says is what is. It is truth. It is impossible for God to lie. He's not a man that he could lie. He's God. Whatever God says comes to pass, so how could he lie? God's word is true. So if I read in God's word, if I look in God's word, and you see, I was raised up in a denominational um, church as a child. My mother, my dad wasn't saved. My mother was, and she dragged me to church. I went to every single service, and I'm so grateful for a mother that didn't give up on me and wouldn't say, no, I'm not going to go to church because it's too hard. But she said, I'm taking my children to church, and because of my mom, I'm serving God. But I wasn't taught that the word of God that I read in the, in, as a child was applicable to today. But then I got, I, got, I got back to God after my rebellion years and the Lord showed me and began to teach me that his word is true and that it's as applicable today as it was then. What God said to the prophet Isaiah, the promise of God to Isaiah is the same promise to me today in the 21st century. What Jesus did for the first century church, he'll do today for the 21st century church. That the word of God is unchanging. That God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what I saw in the word of God then is applicable and will happen today. All the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. So I had to learn that what God said was true. And if I would begin to believe it, 
If I begin to declare it, if I begin to use it as a sword and as a weapon against the enemy who wanted to come after my kids, that I begin to see the enemy taken out by the word of God coming out of a mouth from a heart that began to believe God. So my question to you is, how much do you believe God for the promises of God for your family? And do you know the promises of God for your families? I just read you Psalm 127. There's a lot of promises just right there. So I'd say start digging in the book because there's a whole treasury of potential promises for your family. Wealth and riches and everlasting life in this book. And I'm not talking about just money because money doesn't buy happiness. It doesn't buy healing when you're sick. It doesn't buy healing for a broken heart. Money can't mend a broken marriage. Money can't mend broken families. But all the riches of God can mend it all. So God is sovereign, his word is true, and God's love can fix anything. Those three things. God is sovereign, he's king. His word is true, and his love can fix anything. And learning those things, and based on that foundation in our lives, we began to launch out and raise our kids. Now, we were not perfect parents, and our children are probably going to come up here and share some things. And I'm a little bit in fear and trepidation, not tonight, but through this series. I hope they do because they're adults now and they're awesome people. We've got wonderful pastors that are going to share on parenting, but there are no perfect families in this house, but there is a perfect God. So we didn't do everything right. We did a lot of things wrong. And in spite of our wrong, God made an amazing family. But it wasn't always that way because we had one child on drugs. We had some, some pregnancies before marriage. Oh, we've had a whole plethora of things that families shouldn't have, especially as pastors. And we as pastors live in a fishbowl and everybody looks in. So we had to learn to live life transparently. So I gave you six things and I, I'm on the fourth one, so I'm just gonna go a quick review. Number one, we had to learn to be united as a couple. Make a plan and work a plan. There's something about unity in the kingdom of God. If you are together, if you can agree on something together, can two walk together unless they agree? But when you begin to agree, there's not a devil in hell or one loosed on the earth that can break the union of faith between a husband and a wife when they believe God for something. Jim and I had to learn to be united. We had to be honest as a family, transparency and honesty. We had to learn to die to self and die to self-image and die to what people think of us. Right now, you are judging me. Right now, you're looking at me and you're listening to me. You're looking at what I'm wearing. You're looking at what I'm doing. You're thinking about how old I am. I don't know, all the kinds of millions of thoughts humans do when they look at people. I'm being judged. It's all right. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not mad at you for doing that. I expect you to do that. But you see, there comes a time when you've got to die to all that. And you've got to realize that it doesn't matter what people think. It matters what God thinks. It doesn't matter what your, your family or your in-laws or, or your kids think or your neighbors think. But what does God think and what has God told you to do? And you've got to be honest because when you begin to lie, when you begin to hide things, and you put things in the shadows, you see, the enemy, Satan, is a God of darkness, little g, God. And Jesus said there is no truth in him. So his MO is lying and deception. So when I don't speak the truth in love, which is the Christian way and the kingdom of God way, then I'm giving permission to the kingdom of darkness to put my family in the darkness and in the shadows. And when you start to cover things up, then you got to remember what you said. Then you start worrying about what if the kids find out? What if this happens? But you know, when you bring it to the light and you expose it, you have nothing left to fear. It's clean, it's out in the open, it's cleansed by Jesus. So Jim and I figured a long time ago, we have no image to maintain or create. We better just be who we are. So transparency and honesty. We were always honest with our kids and we were always honest with you. We had to learn how to pray. God taught me about fervent, focused, faith-filled, word-based prayer. The prayer of the righteous. The prayer, the fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. When the enemy is coming after my kids as teenagers and wanting to rip them out of the kingdom and tear them apart, God told me I better learn how to pray. I better learn how to get tough. I'm in some kind of a war. Hell's coming against my family. I'm a warrior woman of God and I better stand up and not be sniveling and cowardly, but I better stand up and understand who he is 
who I am in him. The weapons of my warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of every stronghold. And I began to learn that the shield of faith, that amazing shield of faith, I could hold it up against all the circumstances, against all the lies, against everything Satan was breathing down my neck about my kids. And then I could take out the sword of the spirit, double-edged sword, sharp, cutting, cutting asunder. And as I began to take out the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the promises of God, and I began to decree and declare out of my mouth as a woman of God, a woman of God on this planet, in this world, but not of it. Standing here, yes, I can be a ditzy, fun little blonde, or I can be a woman of God. Listen, you are who you are, but know who you really are. And you can have fun, and you can be human, and you can be all of these wonderful things. But when hell's coming against your family, you better know who you are in Jesus. And it's not time to joke around. It's time to pull out the weapons and go to war. And you better know how to use it. So I began to pray, and I began to pray fervent. Focused, faith-filled, word-based prayers, and I began to be skilled with the sword of the Spirit. Because the enemy wanted to come after my girls. He wanted to destroy their lives. He wanted to destroy my son's life. And we, Jim and I, in united front, said, oh, hell no. Oh, hell no. Hell no. You are not taking my children out. You are not dismissing destiny. You are not going to do these things. So I looked at prayer. And then number four, and this is where I stopped last week, two weeks ago. And number four, God taught me as a woman of God and as a mother, a stepmother of a daughter who had come back to us at 21. Kim, she's 40 years old now, March 30th. She is so mad at me for saying that. She looks like she's 18, but she's going to be 40. But when Kim came back to live with us because she was Jim's daughter, I was a wicked, evil stepmother. And we were pastors, and Kim would just come and visit us. She didn't ever live with us. But when she was 21, she came to live with us. She called us on the phone, and she says, I'm scared for my life. We went and rescued her literally out of Las Vegas. And Kim came to live with us. My kids were, Jess was about 14, Luke was about 11. They were little. They were still in school. Here comes Kim. She, I remember, I'll never forget when we came to get her. She came to church the next day. She had a, remember that? Do you remember that dress? Oh my gosh, I took you shopping, but you wouldn't wear anything about you. She had a dress right to here. Skin tight leopard dress. Cleavage down to here. White hair. All kinds of earrings everywhere. And she came and sat on the front row and I looked at her and I said, yeah, there's pastor's daughter, of course. <laughs> but Jim had been preaching. He said, one day my, water, my daughter's going to come. She's going to live with me. God's going to restore our relationship, and she's going to walk this aisle, and she's going to get saved. And that girl got saved that Sunday. She's been gloriously serving God. And it's been a journey. But Jim was afraid that I was going to chase her away because she, she had to have some things taken off of her. I mean, she was, Kim, you were a mess. She was a mess, and she was a great little liar. And she would look at her dad with these big, big, she's got these big brown eyes, you know. And she'd look at her dad and bat him, and dad would just hug, melt, or whatever she wants. I knew she was out still doing some drugs, and she was out crowsing around, and I knew she was sneaking out at night. And I was really, I was very concerned. And Jim was afraid I was going to chase her away. And we went on this vacation, and we were in Abaca Island with some missionaries from Costa Rica. And it was just a very developed, underdeveloped nation, Abaca Island. It was a great place to have a little vacation. I mean, there's no electricity. You have to ride bicycles. It's a great place to see God. And there I was crying out to God, and I heard the voice of the Holy Spirit say to me, Debbie, love her to life. That's all he said to me, love her to life. And there God began to take me on a journey of learning how to love, how to love a wayward child back to the life of God. Because God is love, and love creates life. And my old nature, my fear, and my frustration wanted to judge her to death, but God wanted me to love her to life. And so God began to teach me about the love of God. And I wanted to read this to you about the love of God, because this is what's going to fix a family. There's a book by Paul Billenheimer, and he writes in love covers. And let me just read this to you. God is love. He is love. It's not one of his characteristics. It's who he is. Agape love. The God kind of love. 
And this is what he writes, and he's gone on to be with the Lord, but in his book he writes to this present day with few exceptions. The church has failed to comprehend that agape love is the ultimate and therefore the supreme power in the universe. Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth, Matthew 28, 18. If this is literally true, there is only one power in the universe. So far as universal cosmic intelligence is concerned, power that is not permanent is not power at all, even while it masquerades as such. This is the way God sees it because he lives in eternity and sees things from the eternal standpoint. Viewed from an eternal standpoint, power that is not permanent is already destroyed. Therefore, every thought, word, plan, purpose, motive, or action that is and does not originate and operate by agape love is counterproductive. It ingests the seeds of its own destruction. Any work or ministry or family that is built and maintained by any other method other than agape love, any religious success that is achieved or promoted by anything else is therefore false, fading, and unreal. Such labor for God is only shadow boxing. Agape love is the only redeeming force in the universe. With apologies to Emmett Fox, the following is a paraphrase of his inspiring poem over love. There is no difficulty that enough agape love will not conquer. There is no disease that enough agape love will not heal. No door that enough agape love will not open. No gulf that enough agape love will not bridge. No wall that enough agape love will not throw down. And no sin that enough agape love will not redeem. It makes no difference how deeply seated may be the trouble, how hopeless the outlook, how muddled the tangle, how great the mistake, a sufficient realization of agape love will dissolve it all. If only you could love enough, you would be the happiest and the most powerful being in the world. Love them to life. So what does that mean? What does that practically mean in my every days? Well, I had to learn some things. I had to learn that agape love, that God's love actually had characteristics. It actually was mentioned and actually taught in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter. So I'm just going to go there with you. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, because I had to learn how to come under the authority of this love. That I had to see that these things were Jesus. And that just as if I saw Jesus in the physical and I would bow my knee to him and say, you are my king, I will do what you say to do. When these characteristics had the opportunity to play in my life, I had to come under their authority. Does that make sense? So listen to this. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not prate itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity. But rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. Agape love believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. You see, when I understand that love is a person, a being, that he isn't rude, when I understand that he is not easily offended, when I understand that he does not cower down and bow down to failure, but he stands up and bears all things until as a sovereign Lord of the universe, it becomes what he has said it becomes. And that's the love of God. That's my God. So as I begin to bow my knee to that power and I begin to let it operate in my life, things begin to change. So when I needed to be long suffering with Kim because I knew she was lying, I had to learn what it meant. Long suffering. I had to learn that it's the ability to put up with adverse circumstances without quitting or taking on a spirit of retaliation. I had to learn that I can be steadfast and constant under extreme pressure. I had to learn that I can keep going no matter what. It describes a person who has the power to exercise revenge, but instead exercises restraint. When God said to me, now you've got to know what it's like not to be easily offended. Let me just read this one to you, because this one I had to use a lot. Love is not easily offended. Love thinks no evil, is not easily provoked. What does that mean? Love is not touchy. Agape love is not fretful or resentful. It will not be easily exasperated, frustrated, or stirred up. It remains quiet. When you know they're lying through their teeth and you can call them out on it, you shut up. Instead of causing a fight and you, do, you deal with it later. Hmm. How about that one? Love does not allow itself to be easily offended or easily angered. It can keep us cool when others are hot and bothered. Love thinks no evil. What does that mean, God? I got to love her to life. I got to think no evil. When I know she's doing evil, what do I do? To calculate. 
to consider, to reckon, to evaluate, draw a logical conclusion. Love calculates, considers, reckons, evaluates, and draws a logical conclusion. The Greek word is logizomai. It means to decide the outcome and put every action into a debit or a credit position. What does that mean? It means I pay no attention to a suffered wrong. I take no account of the evil done. It means that instead of keeping score, I take out a big eraser and I erase all the resentment. My goodness. This is a power beyond anything we know. The agape of God, the love of God. When we begin to love our families like this, because the family is the test tube of love, this is where God says, now you get to learn how to operate in this power, in the very atmosphere that is the hardest to deal with, and that's the family. And as you begin to love each other to life, as you begin to bear all things together, believe all things, you believe the best, even when the reports are coming in, you don't cower to them and you don't give in because your faith has the shield up and the promise of God up. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Love creates an atmosphere where people actually can grow and flourish. What does that mean? Well, there's a little story, and it's about the great Amazon jungle. And at the very tip of the South American continent, just not too far from there, is the South Pole, right? Well, they found out that the same seeds, you see, the South Pole will thaw in the summer, and there'll be grasses, and the grasses only grow to this high. But they found out that those same seeds blow with the winds of the earth all the way and they form the very great canopy and jungles of South America. So think about it. The same seeds become grass in the, north, in the South Pole where it's frozen and where there is no heat and there's no life. But when those seeds are brought into an atmosphere where there is sun and warmth and water, it actually forms the great jungles of the Amazon. So atmosphere creates life. Are you with me? Love creates an atmosphere of goodness. Love creates an atmosphere where people want to come home. Love creates an atmosphere where people aren't afraid to be judged, but they know even if they've screwed up and they don't know how to tell their parents, they're going to be loved unconditionally. And they're going to be in an atmosphere where they can grow from the experience and move on. It's not that we hide our heads in the sand and we don't deal with sin, because we have to. But it does mean that we don't judge to death. We love to life. And whether we do it in our families, this is really where we learn. But now we bring it to the house of God and the church. And now we bring it to our differences and all the challenges we have in relationships as people. And now we learn to love each other to life and not judge each other to death. It starts in the home. And so God says, I want you to create an atmosphere of love in your home. How does Kim feel when she's around you? Does she feel safe or does she feel threatened? How do your kids feel? So there were some just practical things. I had to learn to live a lifestyle of forgiveness. What does that mean? I had to relinquish the right to punish. Oh, resentment's a huge thing, isn't it? How we can keep score. Oh, I'm not keeping score, but oh, we are because we remember. But you see, love erases resentment. Love doesn't keep score. It puts it under the blood. So God says, take out your erasers tonight. You're going to have to erase some things in your families because it's not going to bring the atmosphere that you need to see the family change and grow because love creates life. God is love, and he created all life. It means when I forgive that I have to live and be willing to live a lifestyle without blame. What does that mean? It means that you're safe in my space. I'm not going to bring up to you all the things that you've done. I'm not going to remind you of what you failed to do, but you're going to be safe in my space. And when you come into my space, you know you're going to be loved unconditionally. And there's going to be an atmosphere where you can grow and be changed. That's my commitment as a mother. That's my commitment as a believer. Now, I had to learn that love, agape love, and approval are two separate things. Because it's one thing to love unconditionally, which God does, but God does not approve of everything I do. He loves me unconditionally. But there are times when I sin or I am in a lifestyle contrary to his word and his way, and he does not approve of that behavior. So love and approval are different. I can love unconditionally, but it doesn't mean I approve. So if you've got kids that are in lifestyles right now that are unacceptable to God, it doesn't mean that you approve of these lifestyles. It doesn't mean that you're not on your knees intercating and putting out your sword of, your sword of the Spirit and praying. 
Doesn't mean that you're not standing in the gap as the intercessor and pleading the blood over those kids, over their hearts and over their minds. You're praying Psalm 1. Oh, Father, thank you that my children cannot sit in the counsel of the ungodly. Oh, Father, I thank you that my son cannot go where the, where the mockers and the scornful are gathered. I thank you, Father, that my son delights in your law and in your law he'll meditate day and night and he will become a tree planted by the rivers of living water. So you begin to pray the word and pray the promise and declare as a daughter or a son of God on the earth what God says in the in the supernatural because we like God have to learn to speak those things that are not as if they were that's faith so created an atmosphere of love doesn't mean I approve but it means I love there's a big difference it means that I had to give my kids a fresh start and they gave me a fresh start. You know, kids are very forgiving. Jim and I blew it. We lost our tempers. Oh my gosh. Luke got busted when he was in seventh grade, I think, over just a little pack of marijuana that he brought to church, to school. I mean, the kid never did one wrong thing. And he has like three seeds of marijuana and the principal called us. And we were so paranoid by that time because I'd had daughters that had gotten pregnant and everything else that we just grabbed Jessica out of high school and we grabbed Luke out of junior high and we ran him to the clinic and we had him drug tested. We put the fear of God in them. Said, well, this is unacceptable behavior. You're going to do this. This is what's going to happen in your life. And the doctor came out and gave us a little lecture about overreacting. <laughs> do you remember that? Did we do everything right? No. We dealt with sin. We set our boundaries. And we were honest with our children. And we kept a standard of godliness in our home. But we learned how to love our kids to life. We've learned how to love this church to life. So I'm going to have to choose to love. I'm going to have to choose to forgive. I'm going to have to understand that agape love is my new nature. It's the God nature. And I am now a daughter or a son of God. And I now have the love of God shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Spirit. I had to learn, number five, how to listen to the Holy Spirit. He is the umpire of our souls. And when my kids were out, boy, I'll tell you, my... Little Jess, she's Pastor Jess now, and Jess, you know, when I think of you, I think you're an amazing woman of God. But I'm telling you, she was a little Jacob in our family. She was the prettiest little thing, and she could look at me, melt my heart, and just tell me a lie, and i just believe it. And her father would say, she's lying. I'd say, no, she's not. Quit picking on her. She's lying. No, she's not. Then I'd find out she's lying, and oh, then all hell would break loose, because I got a little Swedish temper. You know, my Vikings are from my background, you know, so, oh, don't mess with me the old nature. But I had to learn to listen to the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit knew what my kids were doing. When I couldn't be there, when I didn't know what they were doing in high school, when I didn't know what they were doing online, when I didn't know what they were doing, the Holy Spirit did it. He would tell on them all the time. And I want you to find this scripture with me in Colossians, because this is a great scripture. We're almost done. Are you all right with me? I'm scary, aren't I? Okay, here we are. The Holy Spirit, Colossians 3.15, and this is in the Amplified. I love this translation. It says, and let the peace, the soul harmony which comes from Christ, rule and act as an umpire continually in your hearts, deciding and settling with finality all thoughts and questions that arise in your minds. In that peaceful state, be, be, in that peaceful state to which as members of Christ's body, you were called to live and be thankful, appreciative, giving praise to God always. And this is what the Holy Spirit said to me. He said, listen, you can't be everywhere but I am. And you've got to learn to walk in faith with these kids. And I know the enemy wants to scare you. He wants you to be nervous about what's going to become of them. He wants you to be embarrassed about being pastors and your kids are messing up and they're doing this and they're doing that. He says, but you've got to understand that I will parent these children. And when you can't be there, I am. And this verse says, finally, let the Holy Spirit act as an umpire in your soul. So the visual here, the metaphor here is an umpire. What's an umpire? He wears a black and a white striped shirt. He has a whistle. He's on the sidelines watching us play the game. And when something goes wrong, when there's a foul, when there's an error, when he has to judge the game, he'll blow the whistle, will he not, the umpire? Well, the Spirit of God, listen, when something's not right, when something's not going right, when you don't know what it is, but you know something's not right, you're going to get an uh in your spirit. You're going to get a check in your spirit. You're going to know, I don't know what it is, but something's not right here. 
And then the Holy Spirit, if you'll begin to talk to him and ask him, he'll show you what is going on. I remember, and Kim, I'm using you as an example because it just worked that way. Because she is amazing. Kim, I'm so sorry. I don't want to be picking on you, darling. You're amazing. You're amazing. But Kim, I mean, she'd been so good. She'd gotten changed and clean and working at the church. And she was just, just amazing. And she, she hadn't gone out with anybody. And there was just one little incident that happened. And it was... You know, she just fell. Listen, Christian, let me tell you about your daughters. Christian girls will get pregnant because they're trying not to. But they don't want to sin, so they're not going to go get birth control pills. So that one slip up, and then they are absolutely stuck. We need to love our daughters, not make them so nervous and, and under such pressure that they know that they can't come to us with anything. And we were having a daughter's conference and I was getting, I was busy, ready to host it. We had all these big speakers coming and the Holy Spirit said, Kim's pregnant and she's afraid to tell you. And I said, oh, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> then I told Jim and he said, oh, that's the devil. <laughs> it wasn't the devil, it was the Holy Spirit. And he knew Kim's heart and he knew how scared she was. I was pregnant. I ran away because I got pregnant. My sister got pregnant. My other daughters got pregnant. I know about girl, good girls getting pregnant. And you can have all the free love you want, but women still get pregnant. Fathers, love your daughters. Protect them. You know men better than women do. We are so stupid as women, we don't have an idea about men. But you know men. You better protect them. Help them. They're not going to like it, but you've got to teach them. Because we don't know, as young, beautiful women, what in the world men are thinking. And you've got to protect your daughters. I went to Kim and I said, Kim, you're pregnant and you're afraid to tell me. And she just burst into tears. She was. And it was all right. It was okay. Because God loves. And God's love can fix anything. And like my mom said when I got pregnant, Debbie, there's always room for a baby and there is always room for a new life. Always. When we love people to life, there's always room for a baby. It's always room for a baby. It's a gift from God. Maybe it was screwed up what we did, but you know, that's where the blood comes in. We get forgiven and we move on and we learn from our mistakes and we grow up as believers and we don't judge to death, but we love to life and we help as a family and we don't condemn. <laughs> Trust the Holy Spirit. He will tell you when the kids, listen, you better know what your kids are doing online. You better be checking their drawers and under their things. You better be looking at their cell phones and be looking at their history. You better be looking at this stuff. It is your job as a parent to know what your children are doing because there's a lot of, I'm not going to say a bad word, there's a lot of bad stuff out there and Satan wants to take our kids out and pornography and sin will sear your soul. It's a spirit behind it. It goes into the human heart. It actually carves out and it sears. It's a spirit behind it. It's a spirit of lust and it will begin to actually decompose and it will devalue the humanity of what our children are and we had better protect them. They're not going to like it, but that's where you stand up. You grow up and you be the parent. You're not a friend to your children. You are the mother and the father to your children. And they may really dislike you in their teenage years, but I can tell you right now, they will get over it. Amen. And they will serve the Lord. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Number six, the last one I'm finished here. Rest in faith. We've got to enter the rest of faith. We've got to let God be God with our kids. I got to act like God acts. He speaks those things that are not as if they are. And I got to learn to just rest. Lord, we're not a perfect family. We're going to make mistakes, but you're a perfect God and your love can fix anything if we'll just stay together and do these things. And so I just want to read this verse to you. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9. It says, therefore, there remains a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself ceased from his works as God did from his. This rest means that I'm not striving to make something happen. I can't make my children serve God. 
I can't make my children love God. I cannot make my children love me. But I can be a woman of God and consistent in unity with my husband. I can learn how to pray. I can be honest. I can walk in the love of God. I can create an atmosphere of love. I can let the Holy Spirit be my umpire, and I can learn to let God be God in my life and in my family and realize that what looks like a mess today is not necessarily what it's going to look like tomorrow. Because I cannot judge tomorrow, as my husband has said so many times, by today, it is subject to change. And when I cease from my own work, just like God did from his, I enter into the rest of faith. In other words, I quit striving in my human ability. Because I can make things happen with my strong personality. I can force my way. I can do things. So can you. We're human beings made in the image of God. Listen, you are magnificent. You're made in the image of God. God's made you fearfully and wonderfully. You are brilliant. There's no one like you. No one. And there's, there isn't anything, if you put your mind to it, you can't do. But you see, you can do that in the flesh, in the natural. But God says, I'm not, I don't want you in the natural. I want you in the supernatural. Because my arm of flesh cannot access the kingdom of God. It's a different kingdom. It's a different power. It's a different system. And if I'm going to watch the miraculous in my life and in my family, I'm going to have to learn how to rest. Stop striving in my ability and step in to what God says and do what God says and rest that even if I don't see it happen yet. Listen, there was a time when our oldest daughter, Miranda, she got pregnant, she got married. We said, don't get married. She got married anyway. She got divorced. Okay, what's gonna happen now? She's got a little baby. She came to live with us. God just happened to bring a man all the way from South Africa, all the way to live with us. So that was a story in itself, Hanny Bosman. We'd been to Africa so many times, Jim was tired of all the company we had. He says, that's it, no more Africans are coming to live with us. <laughs> then Henny Bosman calls and says, Carl Saunders has sent me here to the United States and he told me that I'm to look you up. And so Jim wouldn't even return his call. He left him at the airport. He found his way to our office and he got a hold of my husband. He says, hi, I'm Henny Bosman. And he looked at, at Henny and he says, well, Come on, I'll take you home. And as they were in the car, the Spirit of God spoke to my husband and said, let him live with you as long as he wants to. So thinking that Henny's going to live with us for two weeks, he's on a short journey here from Africa, South Africa. Our daughter's already got one room. Kim's got another. Just, I mean, we got a full house. We got a little baby living with us. Our church is exploding and growing. And Jim says to Henny, listen, the Holy Spirit just spoke to me. And he says, let, you, you can stay as long as you need to at my house. How long, how, how long do you need to stay? And he says, I'm, a, I'm, a year, I'm here for a year and a half. My visa's a year and a half. <laughs> Jim about fainted at the steering wheel and had an accident. He still has his mouth open to this day. Look at you. Do you remember that? So Henny, had, we had no bedroom. So Henny, because my daughter's in one and all my other kids. So Henny had to sleep on the couch. And we thought, oh my gosh. So here's my daughter Miranda with her baby divorced and broken hearted and here's Henny sleeping on the couch and for a year and a half and lo and behold one day Jim and I are looking out the door and they're walking together and he goes look at them I said what are they doing <gasps> he's taking her hand <gasps> he's taking her hand he's taking her hand <gasps> he kissed her oh my gosh and they came to us and said we love each other can we get married and they have the Rock of Temecula, four beautiful boys. And God brought a man all the way from South Africa to marry my daughter. Let me tell you, there is restoration and redemption in everything God touches. Everything. They are an amazing family. My grandsons were here just two weeks ago. They're just big strapping boys. I got 10 grandsons. I'm this little old grandma with these big, huge grandsons. I love it. I'm here to tell you that God will restore our families. We can't figure out who your kids are going to marry. How did they make such a mess of their lives? How can anything come out of this? Oh, let me tell you, with God, what is impossible with man is possible with God. So, families, all my children are serving God. All my grandchildren love God. The legacy that Jim and I are going to leave on this earth when one day we close our eyes and we get to go home. And that will be a glorious day for us. 
We'll leave a legacy of a good name, an honest name. But better than that, we'll leave a legacy and an inheritance of godliness that we knew the living God and he knew us, that our children know and love and serve him and that they love him and he loves them, that our grandchildren and our grandchildren's grandchildren and our grandchildren's grandchildren's grandchildren, should the Lord tarry, we leave a legacy of godliness that there'll be sons and daughters of God on the earth through our lineage because we chose to stop the sin to do what God said, to be honest, to be in unity, to learn how to pray, to learn how to believe God, to learn how to love our family to life and our church to life, to learn to let the Holy Spirit be our umpire because we don't know what in the heck we're doing. And to learn how to rest in faith that you cannot judge tomorrow by today because with God, what is impossible with man is possible with God. I'm done. God we serve. What an amazing God we serve and how he loves us. You know, if you don't know the Lord tonight and you're here, none of this is going to work without you first submitting your heart and your life to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. This is where it all begins. Before we do anything else, I'm going to ask you to sit because I'm going to pray. I believe God wants to break some things tonight off of them. But before we do that, nothing can start until you first bow your heart and your life to Jesus. Listen, I know what it's like to be in sin. I was raised with a godly mother, but I chose to rebel. I have no excuse except my own stupidity and rebellion. And yet God never let go of me. He never let go of me. When I was doing acid on the cliffs of Santa Barbara, when I was about ready to trip out, God said, oh, no, you don't put my mind back into my body. And I was clear, and I never touched it again. God knows how to deliver our kids. God knows how to rescue our children. God knows how to rescue us and rescue our souls. But if you have not bowed your knee first and foremost to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, this is where it begins. What does that mean? It means that you realize that, number one, we are all born into sin. We cannot save ourselves. We are born this way. That's why we have to be born again and reconnected with God. And there's only one person that can do that, and that's God himself. Jesus Christ, all God and all man. He came. He came to die for us because we couldn't die. We couldn't save ourselves. And he says, if you'll look at my cross and if you'll realize I am who I say I am, I am all God and I am all man. I am your Savior and I'm your only way to the Father. He says, if you'll look to that cross and you'll believe and you'll let me be your Savior and your Lord, Lord means boss, you'll be born again and I'll take you out of the kingdom of darkness and I'll bring you into my kingdom. You'll be a son or a daughter for the eternity with me. But it begins first with coming to that cross and saying yes to Jesus. If you've never done that tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity. If you need to get right with God or you've never, never said yes to Jesus Christ, I'm just going to ask you, just, we're going to do it all together with heads up and eyes open because this isn't for cowards. It's personal. But if you can't say yes to Jesus in this safe place, how can you walk out those doors in a hostile life environment and live for God? So I'm just going to count to three. And if you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm talking to you. If you've backslid and you serve God like I did as a child, but now you know Jesus is real, but you've not served him and you need to get right. You're here tonight for this. I'm talking to you. You've been a good person, better than I'll ever dream of being. But you've never, never bowed your life to him as Lord and Savior. I'm talking to you. I'm just going to count to three and I'm just going to ask you to lift your hands all over this auditorium. We'll do it together. Are you ready? One two, three, just lift your hands. If you need to get right with God, I see that hand. I see that hand, 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 I see that hand. Oh, lift him high, don't be ashamed. Lift him high, he is Savior and Lord. Okay, this is what we're gonna do quickly. I see that hand, there's hands going up everywhere. We're gonna stand, we're gonna sing this song. I want you to grab your purse, your Bible, whatever you brought to church with you, a friend if you need a friend to come with you. I want you to meet me at this altar. We're gonna get right with God and then we're gonna pray over our families tonight and our children. So just come quickly. If you need to get right with God, get born again. Come back to the Lord. We dedicate your life now. Come quickly, come quickly, come quickly. Let's get right with God. Come on quickly. He loves you, he's not mad at you, he's not shocked over your sin. 
He already knows everything. He's gone. Come quickly, come quickly, come quickly. You're still coming. Quickly come, quickly. If you wish you would have come and you didn't, we'll give you time. Just come quickly. Just jump out of your seat. Run down here. Salvation is free. It's a free gift, but you've got to receive it. You've got to receive it. You've got to say yes to God. Yes. Yes to him. Yes, your Savior. Yes, your Lord. Come into my life, Lord Jesus, and change me from the inside out. You're not joining a church, but you're saying yes to Jesus. When I stood before a pastor and I recited vows and I became Mrs. Jim Cobray. Just by saying some words, I became, my whole life changed, my name changed, everything changed. That's what you're gonna do tonight. You're gonna stand before the living God and you're gonna pray and he's gonna change your name. He's gonna write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. He's gonna give you the Holy Spirit and everything's gonna change from the inside out. Nothing will change on the outside yet, but you are changed. This is so simple, and I'm going to do what I normally don't do, but we're going to do this tonight. We're going to pray right here. And then I'm going to ask you to come with me. We're going to go, and we're going to give you some material because I want you to know what's happened and what you've done, and we'll explain some things to you. But let's pray right now because you came to get saved. You came. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God? Yes or no? Do you believe that he died on the cross? Do you believe that he raised from the dead? Do you believe that he is seated at the right hand of the Father and that he is God himself? Then let's pray this prayer with heads bowed now and eyes closed. Now let's pray this prayer. He hears your heart. I want you to say, Father, here I am. I ask that you forgive me of all my sin. You know it better than I do. And Lord God, I ask that as you forgive me, that you would allow me to be a daughter, to be a son. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten son. I believe that he died for me. I believe that you raised him from the dead for me. And I believe that he is now my savior and my Lord. Come into my heart, take my life, help me to become the child of God that you want me to be. From now and into eternity, I belong to you and you belong to me. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to the family of God. Welcome to the great and the mighty family of God, the eternal family. Now I'm going to ask you to make a left turn. This is Dr. Becker. We're going to take you, we're going to give you a book my husband wrote. You're not joining the church, but we want you to know what you've done. You can come right back and join your family. Now, this is what I want to do. Will you permit me five more minutes? If your families are messed up, I want you to come to this altar right now. If you are believing God for your families, your kids aren't saved, they're not serving God, families are messed up, I want you right in this aisle right now, right here. It is the will of God to restore our families. It is the will of God that they not be caught up in the traps and the deceptions of the enemy. But we're going to have to make a plan and work a plan. Get in unity with God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, and each other. We're going to have to learn to be honest and transparent because God already knows anyway. What are we hiding? We're going to have to learn how to pray. We're going to have to learn how to love them to life when we want to just uh, take out their last, you know, we're going to have to learn to let the Holy Spirit be our teacher and our umpire. We're going to have to learn how to rest in faith. God spoke to me when my heart was so broken over my kids. God spoke to me one day and he said, will you stop worrying? He said, if, if I can take Joseph from his family who betrayed him and sold him into slavery, if I can take him from a prison in Egypt to the second in command over all that nation, can I not take care of your children? Do I not know where they are and what they're doing? You have to trust me and put them in my hands. He is God Almighty. So right now, I just want you to take your children. Just put them in your hand. 
hold them up to God. Pastor Jim, I'm just going to ask if you'll come up here with me because I need you. Please. Don't give me that look. I need you as the father of this house. Put him in your hand. We're going to do this by the Spirit. It's God's will that they be saved. It's God's will that they serve God. He said, cast all your cares on him for he cares for you. So right now, I just want you to lift these children up to God. And I want you to speak their name to God right now in the name of Jesus. Just tell God who they are. Just say their names out loud. It's all right. Say their names. Now, have you given them to God? I want you to say, Father, these children, these children were given to me as a gift. Were given to me as a gift. But they don't belong to me. They don't belong to me. They belong to you. They belong to you. Therefore, therefore, I give them to you. I give them to you. And I ask. And I ask. As a loving father. As a loving That father, you watch over them. That you watch over them. That no weapon formed against them will prosper. No weapon. That the enemy will not be able to take them out. The enemy will not be able to take them out. But you will keep them. That you will keep them. And you will bring them in. Bring them to in. the family of God. The family of God. For I believe, For I believe the, promise of God the promise of God that says there's hope in my future. There's hope in my future. That my work will be rewarded. That my children shall return from the land of the enemy. And they will come again into their own border. Therefore, in the mighty name of Jesus, I put my children in heaven's hands I leave them to your care your protection your deliverance and your posterity cause them to walk in their destiny in the mighty name of Jesus amen and amen now wait we're not done now we want to break some curses off of you and I want you to pray because I know by the spirit you've got some things in your spirit well let's do this there's family inheritance that goes for years and years. It's like you grow up, you never want to be like your mom and dad. I don't ever say I'm going to be like my mom and dad. I'm not going to be like my mom and dad. And then all of a sudden, you start acting like your mom and dad. And all of a sudden, you start doing this stuff for your mom and dad. And all of a sudden, when you get really old like me and Debbie, then all oh my, my goodness, you are your mom and dad, you know? And it's like, forget that stuff. So we decided we're not going to, we're going to change the destiny of our family. When we were young, we said, this is the way it's going to be. They weren't going to be like my family. They weren't going to be like her family. We weren't putting up with that stuff. And we just are going to break that family curse that goes from generation to generation. The Bible says that sins passed along to, from the fathers to the sons. Well, in the name of Jesus, we're going to break that off. And there's a new future. And we're new creatures in Christ Jesus. And we don't have to live like our earthly parents. We can live like our heavenly parents. And we can do this in Jesus' name. So every one of us, let's believe God right now. Let's say this out loud. Close your eyes. Let's say this out loud. Say, Father. Father. I come to you. I come to you. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I break. I break. Every demonic curse. Every demonic curse. Over my life. Over my life. My family. My family. My children. My children. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And I loose. And I loose. A future. Built by the Holy Spirit. Built by the Holy Spirit. And I thank you, Lord. And I thank you, Lord. That I am free. I am free. And I have the victory. And I have the victory. The blood. The blood. Is over my family. Is over my family. The hedge of protection. The hedge of protection. Is around my family. Is surrounded by my I family. I thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We will think. We will think. We will act. We will act. We will be. We will be. What God says. What God says. Not the heritage of the past. Not the heritage of the but past. The in Jesus. But the future in Jesus. But the future in Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm free. I'm free. My kids are free. My kids are My free. future's free. My future's Thank free. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive. I'm alive. Now give the Lord a great big praise. I want to do one more thing. God is
is redemptive. What does that mean? It means God buys back and he restores. In the human personality and in the human family, there are gifts and callings. God uses families. Just like when Moses needed to build a tabernacle, there was two men, Oliab and I can't say their names, but Basil or who, they were craftsmen. They could form and fashion gold and make the Ark of the Covenant and the cherubim. They had the skill in their hands to do that. There were weavers, there were craftsmen. God's personality is in us. And these are redemptive. They're not bad, they're glorious. And so we want to pray over our children that the gifts and the callings of God will find a fruitful and a wonderful place to manifest and to be successful and bring the kingdom of God into the earth. We want to bring an atmosphere of growth and increased capacity into our children's lives. And it may be, you know, like I've heard it say, gosh, if your kids are drug dealers, are probably entrepreneurs, you know? They just need to start businesses, that's all. They should have just did the wrong business. God's redemptive. He takes what's evil and he brings it to good because you're in the God nature and you're made after the image of God. So I want you to take your children. And I want you to think about your family, the gifts that are in your family. We're preachers. Jim can sell oil to Eskimos or Arabs and ice cube to Eskimos. I mean, he just has that ability. He can stand up and talk and he can sell you. Guess what? He's a preacher. He's selling the good news. Only it's free. My kids are preachers. My great-grandfather was a tailor from Sweden. My other great-grandfather was a cabinet maker. My son Luke can take his hands, he can get wood and he can make anything. It's just in him. It's a gift. There are beautiful things in our children. Beautiful things in us. Let's believe for the beautiful things to come forth, okay? Look at your children and see the beautiful things in them. We've just cursed the darkness. Now let's bless the goodness. So bring your children. Take them once again in your hands. These are our beloved children, Father, our reward, our inheritance, our legacy. You've given gifts to men. You've put your personality in us. And when you buy it back and restore it and bring us back and give us back all that was lost, we become like you. And we bring the kingdom to the earth. So we lift our children's gifts and callings to you, Father. We ask that you'd give us wisdom. If they're out of our homes and they're adults, and Lord, it's never too late with you. Help us to be the grandparents and the older parents we need to be to encourage and pray for our children with wisdom. If they're young, Lord, and they're not yet gone out of our homes, and give us the wisdom and the strategies of heaven to know how to lead them and guide them. Train up your children in the way they should go in their natural bent and giftings, you said, and they will not depart from them. You put these things in them, now help us to see it. Help us to encourage them and love them to life. And may our children be fruitful and multiply your kingdom. And may the legacy of our seed that you've given us be mighty on the earth. We ask it now in Jesus' name. And Lord, forgive us for the stupid things we've done as parents. And help us to be the God parents, the godly parents like you that you want us to be mothers and fathers in your house. Amen and amen. Amen. Let's do this. We're a little bit late tonight, but let's pronounce a blessing over you. Aren't you glad you came to church? I mean, stop and think about it. That, you know, you may have been one of those people that say, boy, I wanted to sit on the couch. I'm tired. I don't want to go to church. But you got up and you came to church. And because you came to church, what's going to happen in the future with your children and your children's children? Uh, you couldn't write books about what's going to take place because of tonight in the spirit realm in this place. You have to hold on to that. You have to hold on to that. Never let it go. You prayed. You believed God. You gave it to God. Never let it go. That's the way it is. It's established and no demon in hell is going to take it from you. Come on, somebody. So hold on to it. Hold on to tonight. Hold on to tonight. Hold on to tonight. Hold on to tonight. Hold on. It's done in Jesus' name. Don't let it go. So Father, these are your people called by your name. 
They're blessed in the city and blessed in the field. Blessed coming, blessed going. That everything they put their hand to, they shall prosper. And Lord, about the Inland Empire, we say that the Inland Empire shall be saved. Love you guys. Take Jesus with you this week. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.